Greg Villalobos. I'm here with Adam Mitchinson from Rally Raid, and we're going to talk you through how to make the Rally Raid BMW G310 GS. Okay, Adam, so we're here. We spent the last day and a half making this bike. Um, converting it from the stock bike to the Rally Raid bike. Um, maybe you could start by just telling us a little bit why Rally Raid decided to do a conversion kit for this particular bike. I mean, for us, the bike popped up for a couple of reasons. It's lightweight, it's low CC, it's available worldwide, and it's pretty reasonably priced as well in the UK, which is something that's sort of at the forefront of most people looking to buy a new bike. Obviously, this is a brand new one onto the range, so there's no one out there with one yet, so everyone's trying to get them as uh, quickly as they can and it's um i guess one of the the big things is it's 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 a gs but it's not the big monster 1200 it is a light bike and um it's fairly capable um off-road trail riding but needs a little bit of refinement out of the the factory so it's something far more accessible for sort of all riders of different ranges to get on the 310 compared to something like a 1200 just have a good days trail riding on it so how would a rally raid bike compare to the original without going into like all the specifics because we're going to talk about that but broadly speaking uh, we pretty much redesigned the whole suspension setup front and rear of the bike we changed the cockpit and control sort of systems and geometry of the bike uh, we have our own set of high quality uh, spokes wheels that we also fit onto the bikes uh, the one we built today was sort of a full spec level two kit without a few accessories but the main bulk of our sort of core kit is on the bike now and so Who's going to be um, buying this conversion? Who's going to be doing this to their standard bike? I think this is attracting to a range of people. Uh, some of those people that are going to be sort of their first steps into the off-road. They're looking for a smaller bike that's not as daunting and they've possibly outgrown the performance or handling of the bike in its current state. I mean, out of the box, it's not that great off-road. The suspension's pretty poor. So once someone's sort of got their feet wet and they want to carry on down the path of trail riding they can add and improve their bike with our with our parts alternatively we've got a lot of customers that are coming down off the bigger bikes you know they've done a lot of years on the big adventure bikes and they just want something lighter to pick up i mean they're doing more local riding perhaps not as long distance and they're just something a bit more fun and light yeah, I mean, I remember when I started trail riding, I fell off and picked up my bike a lot. <laughs> so having a light bike is definitely um, the way to go if you're, if you're getting into it. Um, great. Well, we're going to talk through uh, what we've done over the last couple of days. We'll break it down. Um, everything in this video will be available in shorter um, segments as well. Um, this one's going to be the whole thing all together. Uh, hopefully it's going to help you understand uh, some of the reasonings behind some of these rally raid conversion parts and explain how to convert the OEM bike into the rally raid bike. Okay, so before we start on the actual work we did on the bike, it might be helpful to talk a little bit, not in detail, but a little bit about the kind of tools that we had. Like, um, it, we're in your workshop here, so obviously you've got a lot of tools. Is this something that anyone can do? You know, what do you need to do this work? I think it's very doable sort of for the average mechanic or just a hobbyist at home. Just a good set of spanners, sockets and allen keys. There's a few little ones that we're going to detail about. But realistically, it's just your core sort of general workshop tool set that most people have in their, in their workshop. Any specialist stuff, sort of fork spanners and 7mm allen keys for the risers, we supply that with the kits itself. Right, yeah. So um, from what I've seen, it's definitely something that most people with a, that are competent in a garage, in a, in a home garage environment could do. Definitely, yeah. Um, and we've been at it for about a day and a half. It's taken us a little bit of time because we've been doing filming and all the rest of it. Um, how long should it, someone set aside to do this work? So if you've never done anything like this before, but you're kind of confident in your mechanical skills a day and a half to two days to do a bike sort of similar spec to what we did, um, obviously, once you've got familiar with the bike, you can trim that down to sort of a day, maybe even sort of a day and a half. But you, you just want to take your time, make sure you're doing everything correctly. You're working yourself, it's in your own workshop. So if anything goes wrong, it's going to be your bike that it goes wrong on. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, a, a, a competent mechanic in, in a, if you're going to take this to a mechanic, yeah, they might be able to do it in a day. But uh, if, you're on, if you're on your own and you're reading instructions and doing the work, definitely set yourself a weekend and it'll um, 
it'll save all sorts of stress you know give yourself a bit of time So the engine guard is always the first thing we do because it allows us to get the bike up and work on the rest of it. Exactly, you've got a safe platform, the bike's not going to tip off the stand or anything like that. Great, okay. So what does the bike come with? So the bike comes with a plastic uh, engine guard. It's mounted directly onto the sump with some rubber bungs. Um, I mean, it, it works for general road use and sort of light off-roading, but it's not designed for sort of heavy adventure use. The shock, as it stands at the moment, the shock's going to go straight through the engine guard, through the rubber bungs, although there's some damping there. It's still going to put a lot of the force through the sump and the engine, which is a pretty bad idea. Yeah, so really having an engine guard mounted to the engine block um, is limiting. So, uh, yeah, okay. So it was fairly straightforward to get that off. What did we do? It's just uh, four nuts on the bottom to get the actual main plastic bulk off, and then underneath that it reveals... Uh, they're four M8 threaded rubber bungs, and you just have to get the spanner like you see in the video. Make sure you're gripping on that little metal bit at the top of the rubber bung and just uh, ease them out. Once you've done a half turn, you can just do it with your fingers to save damage any paintwork on the bottom of the engine. Yeah, that came off super easy. Um, and like you say, it'd be fine for road work. Um, I mean, it was kind of okay, but you wouldn't want it to take any big hits. Yeah, aesthetically, it looks cool, but the function is just not quite there for what we need to get out of it. Okay. Okay, so that comes off, and what are we putting on, and how do we put it off? So our engine guard's the tubular steel design, and this keeps the weight down, it keeps it very rigid, and it also acts as a bit of a rad protector as well on the 310, because we've got the bars coming right up to the radiator. So once we've got all that sort of, sort of stuff off, we're going to start uh, iron our engine guard up, get that in place, and uh, put all the correct fittings in. And the Rally Raid engine guard uh, is mounted to the frame? That's it, the biggest difference. Um, instead of putting all the force through the engine itself, we go to the rear of the bike, um, so we mount on the actual main rear frame stay and the engine lugs at the front. Uh, it's a very secure, sending all the force through the frame of the bike, not the engine. Okay, um, so talk us through how we did that. Okay, so first step, you need to get uh, our brackets and our new bolts into the engine lugs. So we're moving the OEM ones first. You want to keep these to one side because these are reused in the rear of the engine guard. So using the uh, new cap head screw and spacer washer and bracket, you put those on the front um, facing backwards, making sure they're in the correct left right positions. And then next, it's everything you do at the moment, you want to be finger tight. You don't want to tighten anything up. So everything can rotate and be free to get everything correctly positioned. Uh, once you've got those in, it's a case of it eyeing the engine guard up. You want to put it on the bike left hand first, sort of wiggling it around the front of the bike so you can clear the coolant hose. And once you've got that in a good position, um, if you can just slide the rear of the engine guard up into the sort of the mounts, you can see where they are on the video. And you just put the two engine bolts that you took out originally just to secure that there, get it all held in just for the time being so it doesn't drop on the floor while you're putting the rest on. Yeah, it was pretty straightforward. Um, and do we tighten as we go? No, not for the time being, keeping everything loose uh, until you've done the next step of mounting the brackets onto the engine guard with the two plates. So at this point, you want to get those uh, not tight, finish tight, but just above finger tight. So there's holding some pressure between the engine guard so the two plates are clamped together. Uh, at this point, you can see that everything's lined up. There's no excess pressure or movement on the engine guard anywhere. And then you start tightening it up, going from the rear. So you tighten the two rear ones with the nylocks provided, and then you tighten the brackets, and then finally you tighten the engine mounts, and this locks the position for the bracket. Great. And... Um... Um, I know you're very used to doing this work, but for someone that hasn't done it before, they just use the torque settings supplied? Yeah, all the torque settings are provided in the instructions online. Great.
Okay, Adam, so we've got the engine guard done. What's next? Now we can get the bike up onto a scissor lift and start work on the rest of the bike. We're going to start working on the suspension on the bike. Why do we change the suspension? Um, the bike comes out of the shop with very basic suspension in it. Um, the rear shock's a very heavy unit, very basic. You haven't got really any control over how the shock acts and its performance. And again, with the forks, they're very undersprung, very soft. Just not ideal for sort of a trail or adventure riding. For general road work or a bit of light off-road, it's fine. But for what we want, it's not up to par. Okay. Um, and what are we putting in to replace it with? Uh, so it, on the rear end, we're putting a completely new shock unit in from Tractive. Um, that features loads of different controls, high speed, low speed, compression dampening, rebound dampening, remote preload adjusters, loads of different uh, sort of bling bits. Okay, so you can kind of really go to town to dial it in. Um, and I think you mentioned um, while we're working on it, the ability to very quickly and easily change the, um, the suspension, whether you're riding on your own or if you have luggage, which obviously changes the weight on the back of the bike. Yeah, you can have an optional uh, additional remote preload adjustment uh, that's mounted onto the shot directly. So you, all you have to do is just bend down. You get up to 10 mil of preload adjustment, which is a fair whack considering the uh, actual stroke of the shock itself. So again, that's out on the move, riding pillion, no pillion, luggage, no luggage. You can just keep the bike riding exactly how you want it. Great. And even if you didn't want to get involved in all of the fine tuning, it, they're just better quality components. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's night and day compared to the shot that comes out and all their shots come, um, they have already set up from the warehouse. So if you're not into dialing your shot, just leave it as it is and it's already rated uh, depending on your choice online. Okay, great. Um, so what did we do? How did we get that out? So to get the rear shock out, we need to take the rear wheel out first. Um, so we get the bike up on a stand, the rear wheel out, and remove the plastic uh, hugger and the right hand frame guard. It's just a couple of little bolts, small plastic pieces, and that gives us access to the, the shock bolts. So you want to do the lower shock bolt first before we do the upper one, obviously, because the shock will fall down into the bike, still attached to the swing arm. Um, on the lower one, you want to be careful that the bushing doesn't come out. Sometimes from the factory, they're already Loctited, and some of the Loctites bled onto the bushing. So you've got to make sure that stays in, to, in, in the swing arm as you're taking the bolt out. Uh, lower the swing arm down once you've took the bottom bolt, bolt out, and then just take the top one out. It's a case of just taking the shock out like that through the swing arm in the gap. That's it. Okay, and it didn't take very long. It took um, maybe longer to get the wheel off than it took to get the shock off. So half an hour, do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a, it's a two-bolt job for the shock, uh, except for the small frame guard, and that's just pop on, pop off. It's really, really simple compared to a lot of other bikes. So the rear shock's out, and we're replacing it with a tractive shock, and it's a fairly straightforward to put back in. Yeah, I mean, it's really as simple as just feeding the shock up into the bike, getting that top bolt in. Um, before you put the bolts in, you want to put a tiny bit of Loctite uh, the obviously the thread of the bolt and a small amount of grease on the shaft of the bolt just to make sure that while the, the shock's in the bike it's never going to seize or reduce any sort of action of the shock. Um, so like I said, get the top shock bolt in first. Um, just get it in, it doesn't have to be torqued up yet. And then lift the swing arm, get the bottom one in and once they're both in you can torque them up in the order of top and then bottom one second. Yeah, it was um, really, really quick, really easy. Um, and yeah, it didn't take very long at all.
So why do we change the rear exhaust and what are we taking out and what are we putting back in? So one of the biggest reasons to change your exhaust um, is weight really. So the, the, uh, the steel pipe we're taking out is quite a heavy, very basic construction one. Um, it does the job fine, but unfortunately it's quite heavy. So we put the Scorpion pipes on. Uh, they're about two, two kilos lighter than the standard pipe, which is obviously a great, great deal of weight saved on a bike that's already quite light itself. Um, obviously they sound great. Um, and keep the baffle in, obviously. <laughs> yeah, they look they look great and they do sound great. And I think it really changes the look of the bike, makes it feel a bit more purposeful. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Um, and when you when I was holding the OEM one that you took out and replacing it at, or, and holding the new kit, you could really tell the difference in weight there. Um, OK, so what did we do? First step was taking obviously the OEM pipe off um, with a new pipe that supplied a 12 spline, 10 mil spanner. It's quite a special spanner and that's designed for the special nuts on the back of the cylinder head that hold the pipe on. And so the first job is obviously to take these nuts off. Be careful not to drop them in the engine. If you've got a magnet or anything like that, it's a useful thing to have around. Uh, once they're removed, you want to take the CO2 sensor off. Um, so that's already in the pipe at the moment. Using a 22 mil spanner, you can just crack that off and take it out with your hand. And then after that, the pipe's just being held on by the rear mounting bracket on the pillion footrest. So once everything else off, take this off and then wiggle the pipe because the rubber bung, that'll probably be quite tight if it's a new bike and you just have to sort of ease it off the back of the bike, wiggle it left and right, and then it'll just come out. Great. Um, and there was something that you made a point of making sure was still in the bike. Yeah, so there's a, a small copper shin that goes in the back of the cylinder head in between the pipe and the cylinder head. This comes out quite often when you remove the original pipe, so you just need to make sure before you go any further that you've definitely got that shin properly seated in the cylinder head. There's a small tag to see the rotation, so you know it's in at the correct angle. Great. Okay, so we've got the OEM pipe off. Uh, is the new Scorpion pipe ready to go straight back on? Not quite. It comes in three separate parts compared to a one-piece unit. So we pre-assembled two of the parts. Um, at this point, if you've got a catal catalytic converter, you want to insert it into the space provided. Uh, like the Scorpion instructions show you. If not, just crack on. So you want to install the two parts of the main pipe. Uh, you can line these up correctly by using the tags for the springs. Put the springs on before you put it in the bike. Obviously, it's a lot easier. You've got more space and more control than when it's on the bike and you're trying to fiddle around in there. main thing you want to check is just you've got your pipe cor correctly rotated and positioned and then just butt it in, slide it in, butt it up and get one of the nuts on just to hold it in place. And so putting it back in, I guess it's a case of feeding it in in the right angle and then uh, finger tight or are we tightening stuff up at that point? Yeah, because the Scorpion pipe's got a bit of a bulge for the cat converter, um, you might need to lift the swing arm a tiny bit just to do that, but just feed it under. Then you want to get the two nuts on, supporting the pipe at the back. Obviously, it's still quite heavy to be held on at this time by two loose nuts and a bracket. So push the bracket over the stud and get two nuts on there and you want them as tight as you can finger tight at the moment, obviously, because the pipe might need to rotate left or right because it's a three piece pipe. It can rotate in a lot of different ways. OK, um, and the silencer then just goes straight on. Or so you've got a bracket, uh, you're su supplied with the bracket from Scorpion 2M8 um, nuts and spacers, and you want to put these on the back of the uh, the back of the pipe as per the instructions, but leave them uh, just finger tight. This bracket slotted so it goes left and right. So uh, once you put the pipe on, you adjust the bracket to the correct position of the pillion footrest mount. And then once that's correctly lined up, you can do those up. Great. Um, and is that the end of the process? Not quite. I mean, everything's just about finger tight now. You've got it all, you've checked nothing's fouled, everything's loose. So you, you want to start tightening from the front back, um, the studding, the two nuts on the stud, and you want to tighten those evenly left to right. So you know you've got even pressure on the pipe and then working your way down, you want to put the CO2 sensor in next. Okay, I noticed you did something a little bit kind of special with the CO2 sensor. Um, I'm guessing it was to stop the, the cable from getting twisted. So uh, how do you do that? So I make sure the cable's straight and there's no twist in the cable. I put a little dot of permanent marker uh, on one of the hexes of the CO2 sensor, and I turn it anti-clockwise three and a half turns. Uh, this is the amount of thread that it has. So I know that once I've screwed it into the pipe, there's, no good, there's not going to be any kinks or twists in the actual uh, wiring itself. Okay, so the CO2 sensor's in. Um, what happens next? Now we need to secure the silencer part of the pipe. So making sure there's two nuts that we looked at earlier on the bracket are done up. Uh, and then inserting the nut and the bracket off the OEM uh, pipe setup back through the original pillion mount. 
then just getting that all tight, making sure the pipe's secure. Obviously, you've already secured it at the front end, so the pipe now should be pretty rigid. And then the last step's just the heat shield. So that comes off your OEM pipe. You've got uh, two M6 by 8 bolts provided from Scorpion, and that goes straight onto your new pipe. Okay, great. Um, and using spring pullers to tighten those springs makes life a lot easier. Definitely. I mean, they're about six pounds. They're like the easiest thing to use for springs instead of using pliers. Or uh, I've seen a lot of different techniques, but just a, da a standard spring puller. You don't need anything fancy. Yeah, yeah. I've used needle nose pliers before, and it's pretty tricky. Um, great. So that's the exhaust swapped over. Um, it didn't take. It wasn't particularly complicated. Uh, so about half an hour, an hour for that exhaust. Yeah, I'd say about that for the exhaust. Uh, you just want to take your time, make sure you're not damaging anything or nothing's failed or sort of incorrectly positioned, especially with that rear bracket. Great. Okay, so we're going to go and start working on the front of the bike, but I noticed you put the rear wheel back in. I guess that was just for balance, for because we've got it off the ground. Yeah, I don't really like working on bikes with both wheels out. It feels quite unsafe, so just having that rear wheel in, you know, if the bike does rock back, it's not going to fall off the stand or anything like that. Okay, so that's all the work done on the rear of the bike, and now we work up to the front of the bike. Um, and I guess uh, what's left there is the cockpit and the uh, front shock. So we worked on the cockpit, the controls, the handlebars, all of that stuff first. So why are we changing that from uh, the OEM standard? The main reason is rider input. That's one of the most important things for us. So bringing the bars up higher gives you a better riding position for off-road or standing position for long days. Um, the bars we use have a lot less back sweep than the sort of OEM style bars. So they're more suited to elbows up uh, off-road riding style and just makes the bike feel a little more pronounced in its stance as well. And I guess adding the handguards is a bit of protection considering this bike maybe dropped a bit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, handguards are for us are a must on sort of any adventure bike. If you're riding bushwhacking or even if you're on rocks, they're still protecting something, whether it's your hands or the bike itself. Okay, great. Um, so what's the first thing we did to, to do that? It, it, this part can take a little bit of time. It's, again, it's not complicated, but there's some fiddly steps to it. Yeah, you definitely need to have a bit of a system for it. Um, First job on the BMWs is the bar ends, that's just a simple Allen key removal and then you want to start by loosening all the controls and clusters. Uh, you need to get the left hand grip off which unfortunately is usually glued on quite tight so a bit of heat can help that depending on sort of what your working conditions are, it might come off easily. 
it's the middle of winter here, so we're working in the cold, so we had to use a heat gun to get that off, unfortunately, in an airline just to expand the grip, same as um, seen in other videos. Uh, but once we got the controls loosened and the pins out, it's a case of removing the OEM bars and uh, removing them one left, left hand first and then right hand side so you can get enough length on the cables to get all the controls off. And after that, it's a case of removing the risers. So we change the actual riser unit. We keep the same triple clamp, but change the riser unit to give 20 more mil rise. And it also allows us to add the rent or fat bars, which is one of the next steps. Yeah, okay. So the actual controls, um, uh, the, the, the light units, the indicator units, they don't actually fully disassemble. You've just got to loosen them and then... You, yeah, you want about five, six mil of clearance and you'll see if you can just look down, you'll see a pin and that locates through a hole in the uh, handlebars. That's, all bikes have to have that now. It's um, just to stop the clus clusters or the throttle body actually rotating around the bars. Okay. So that you might have a bit of trouble getting it off, but it, it's just a snug fit. So you've just got to make sure you put in pressure downwards towards the pin. Okay. And then they just slide off and um, once you've undone the central clamp, does that handlebar just come away? That's it. Yeah, and just take the top clamp off, slide the uh, slide the controls and clusters off, and then you're left with the, just the riser unit, which is to remove. Okay. Um, so we've we've taken that off, and we're back to essentially just the top triple clamp, um, and we've got these nice gold fat bars that we're going to put on. Um, so how are the fat bars different to the OEM standard? So obviously, apart from the bar diameter itself. Um, the fat bars have got a lot less back sweep on the bar and a lot more rise. That's more suited towards enduro style adventure riding. Um, gives you a better geometry for standing on the bike, better input, especially in terms of having your elbows out. You're in a more rigid attacking position, keeps the front end a bit more secure. Okay. Um, and did we just take them straight out of the packet and put them on? Unfortunately not, no. Uh, we have to replicate the drilled holes that are in the OEM bars for the clusters. Um, so this is a case of sort of measuring, um, you know, be quite careful, measure twice, cut once on the holes for the uh, clusters. Um, the rotation is very important on the clusters as well, so you need to take note that the OEM bars, the holes for the clusters actually point directly up and down on the left and right hand um, cluster. So if you're not sure where you're going to have your clusters or where you want your bars, I'd suggest you put your bars on the bike and eye it up and then you know for your cluster rotation it has to be directly up or down in, in relation to where the bars would be in the bike. Yeah, so this is a point really where it's quite important to slow down. Um, you're going to be drilling a hole that's quite important. Um, it's, you're not going to break anything, but if you drill it in the wrong place, you're either going to have your controls slightly wrong for you or you're going to have to drill an extra hole. So it's worth just taking yeah. your time, get your tape measure out and just kind of make sure that everything's where it needs to be on this. Definitely. I'd say test it before you put them in the bike as well. So just slide one cluster on at a time. Once you've done the first one, double check that everything looks right and it, you th think it will fit how it should. Okay, great. Um, and in the, the case of actually drilling it, it's fairly standard drill bit? Yeah, just a uh, five mil drill bit. You want just a small vice or hold the bars. You can use a bit of rag to secure them or stop them getting stretched. Um, you can see that I used a punch just to make sure that the drill was centered. You can get them from pretty much anywhere, if not using old blunt drill as a punch. Okay, great. Um, and then we've got the holes drilled. We bring them back and we just start rebuilding it. Yeah, so we've got to feed in like we took them off. Um, and at that point, you can then put the bars back into the new risers and put the top clamp on to secure them while you're working on the grips. Okay, so these are new Rally Raid um, risers that is going on and we've got a new clamp and you get to keep the BMW badge. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm guessing, you know, obviously they're quite important to be talked up to the right setting. Yeah, so one thing that's interesting about the uh, risers on this bike itself, they're, they're held in through rubber bungs. So although logically you might think you need to torque it up as hard as you can, they're designed to actually be torqued up to a certain level and left at that level so they can rotate in the event of crash or force they'll actually rotate instead of damaging themselves. Um, so all the torque settings are provided in the instructions. And like I said, even across diagonally or in a star formation is the best way to do it because then you know you've got even pressure across the unit instead of one side and then the other. Yeah, great. Um, and I guess the last part of that is replacing the rubber grip. 
Yeah. So putting the rubber grip back on, or if you've had a bit of trouble getting the grip off in the first place, you can always go and buy another set. Um, you get a set of grip glue with your new set of grips. If not, you'd probably have a grip glue in the workshop and just grip that left hand one. Make sure it's in good warm sort of conditions so the grip sets and just tap it on. Uh, Great. Leave, leave it. Okay, and something else that we changed on this bike was the actual uh, brake levers. So, again, why? what's the difference between the OEM ones and the ones that you're putting on? So there's a couple of reasons in the BMW's case. Uh, one of the main ones you might have seen before we changed, the levers are so long on this bike, they come out further than the handlebars itself. You can't actually get a set of bark busters onto the bike without uh, chopping the levers. So these levers are similar to sort of the ones we use for the Honda. They've got a six-point positioning system on them. Uh, available in anodized silver or gold and they're just a nice little addition you can use one finger two finger braking and clutch and because of the adjustable position it's good for sort of smaller riders or larger riders that often have trouble reaching or they find the clutches in too close and it's giving them hand cramp yeah yeah I, i've got quite small hands and um I, I know on my bike it's been quite helpful to be able to fine tune the setting of that and um, definitely helps with the one finger stuff which is important if you're doing off-road stuff definitely. Okay, and so the last part of that process was about getting the handguards back on. So the, you can get lots of different kinds. What do we use on, on this bike? We choose to use Bark Busters. Um, we like their design. They've been a long-standing company sort of thing. We're really happy with the quality of their products. Um, they take a slight bit of modification to get them to fit perfectly, as you see on the 310. But, I mean, it's, it's worth it for the end product. Uh, they look really nice. We use the VPS guards on this exact model. Uh, they're available in black or white online, so... And what was the modification? What did we have to do? Uh, you have to drill a, another hole for the, it's an, a 10 mil hole at the front of the uh, support bar. And this just allows, unfortunately, because of the clusters on every bike's different, it just takes a bit of tweaking. So by drilling that hole just 10 mil up from the original one, you can uh, get it all to match up perfectly with, uh, without putting any extra pressure on the bars. It's definitely worth um, drilling that hole. Um, you could try and force uh, the clamp into the existing hole, but it's always going to be under tension, I guess. Yeah, and if you're riding with your hand guards under tension the whole time, realistically, as soon as you take one knock, they're going to spin around because all that tension has to go somewhere. Okay, and so the last thing we did up front there uh, was the windscreen, which is a pretty straightforward swap. Yeah, it's just four bolts on and off. Um, you provided new bolts with the new windscreen. Uh, we developed this with Power Bronze, so this is sort of a, you can only get this from us. Designed to work with Bark Busters and the 310, uh, it gives quite a big increase in the actual height of the windscreen as well, which is good for the road work in between trails. Yeah, I think what I like about it is it's it, it does give you that height and that protection, but because of the cutout for the um, Bark Busters, which gives you the full lock that you need, it means that it's not a, an overpoweringly large screen it's still got quite a light feel to That's it. it it doesn't add any bolt to the real front uh, the cockpit itself yeah it's definitely got quite a, a rally feel at the front okay so that whole process um i think it's worth setting a little bit of time aside for that nothing in there is complicated but uh, it can be a little bit stressful especially if you start getting bogged down like we did a little bit on getting the hand guard off so an hour and a half I'd say an hour and a half to two hours. You're definitely getting that grip off. Take your time if you haven't got another set of grips because you don't want to damage that in any way. And again, working with your bars, you're in that area where you've got your painted tank, you've got your windscreen, your speedo, so you just want to make sure you're not going to scratch anything. Lay a towel down on the fuel tank or something like that before you start because obviously if the bars rotate, you can have some issues there.
Okay, so we've done all of the cockpit controls and the handlebars and everything. So uh, I guess the next quite major upgrade on this bike is the front forks. So are we actually swapping the whole forks? Um, and what are, we, yeah, what are we changing and what are we getting? So we're swapping in this case, the fork internals, the forks stay, stay the same. Um, we extend the forks by 25 mil to suit the 25 mil more travel on the rear shock. Um, although you're not getting actually any travel, it's, it makes the whole bike sit better and more level. Um, the forks themselves actually have a pretty good cartridge system we found when taking them apart. Um, we took them to Tractive and they sort of developed new internals for us. Uh, the design of the GS fork legs is sim similar to some of the newer bikes or mountain bikes where you have all the controls in one leg and the other leg is more just a stabilisation and rebound leg that does more or less nothing. It's to save weight. Um, obviously on a bike that size you don't need a full set of sort of the XC style or weight forks in there. Yeah, I found it quite interesting once we got into it that, um, that, that what is in one fork is not the same as what's in the other, which is what's on my CB. Okay, so how do we actually get the forks out so we can work on them? So before you can get the forks out, you need to obviously get the front wheel out, get the fender off and remove the caliper from the forks. Two M10 bolts, nice and easy. You've got also an ABS sensor that needs removing as well. So just take your time, so obviously that's plastic, so you don't want to damage that in any way. Yeah, that was fairly straightforward. I noticed you um, cable tied them out of the way. Yeah, calipers or caliper mounts, just cable tie them out of the way because it stops them falling on the floor, A, damaging the caliper itself. Uh, you can get air in your caliper or alternatively you can stretch the uh, brake lines and damage them that way. So just cable tie any calipers up to the bike where they would be normally just for safekeeping. Okay. Um, and there was something important you did before we got straight into taking the forks out. Yeah, so you have to undo the top cap of the fork um, you can't actually do this in the vice or you shouldn't do it in the vice because you have to clamp the vice too tight on the fork damaging the internals so if you just loosen the top nut on the upper triple clamp and leaving the two lower ones on the lower triple clamp done up you can use a 17 mil spanner and just loosen the turn loosen the top caps on the forks by two turns before you take them out of the bike itself okay um and it's fairly straightforward to take the forks out after that yeah it's just um two two bolts on the lower triple clamp and then just gently slide the forks out. I think one of the good things is you don't have to take the front of the bike off to access those bolts. Yeah, compared to a lot of other bikes, it's quite easy to work on. Everything's accessible more or less with just a socket and you can get to what you need to. Great. Okay, so those forks are out. Um, I guess we get into a, a bit of a sensitive part. Um, so um, before we get into what we actually do, what kind of area you know can we do this on the floor uh you want somewhere a bit cleaner than the floor i'd suggest um it just takes some time to prepare like a decent workspace make sure you've got a vice that you're fairly confident that it's not going to drop your fork or something like that um you want a measuring device you should usually have one of those anyway if you're working on suspension or engine oils or anything like that um and really just make sure that you, you haven't got anywhere where bolts and dirt can get either down on the floor or into your forks Okay, great. Um, and I noticed um, we took the various elements that were going to be going into the new forks and we laid them out so we could um, get them in the right order. Yeah, yeah. And especially if you stop halfway through, you know where you are with the build. Um, if they're all just in a bag, you don't know what you've taken out, lay them out in order and you can check yourself before you put it all in. So what are the elements that we're swapping? Maybe we could talk through fork by fork because they're different. Okay, so... On the left leg, um, this is pretty much just this is, this is pretty much just a stability fork, like we spoke about earlier. This fork doesn't really do much except from rebound. Um, so on this fork, it's just a very simple case of taking the top cap off, and all we do is add a 25 mil ex extension space for into this fork, and that matches the right hand leg, obviously, to give us that 25 mil um, more length on the fork. So is there any oil in that fork? There is oil in that fork, but for what we need, we don't actually change the oil. Um, because it's a stabilization, stabilization leg, we're just changing the length of it. Okay, so the fork is just worked on in a way that the, the oil doesn't come out. Yeah. Okay. And actually changing that fork was really quick. Very quick, um, but I'd still suggest sort of at least 15 minutes, half an hour. Um, forks are very delicate. They've got very fine threads on them, so you just want to make sure that you're doing everything as carefully as you can. And is there anything to note about how we tightened everything up on that fork before we put it back? So again, like when we took them out of the bike, you need to tighten them as much as you can by hand in the vice, but obviously you're not going to be able to grip the vice and tighten them up all the way. So you're going to have to leave them sort of two turns undone. And then once you put them back in the bike, that's when you can do the top cap up itself. 
yeah yeah okay um so we've done that one we've put it down we pick up the other fork um talk us through what we've got to do on that and what we're what we're changing so this fork contains more or uh, more controls than the other one this fork pretty much does most of the suspension for the front end of the bike it contains your preload and your damp and your spring uh, this fork has a lot more components going into it compared to the other fork, uh, so it does need draining of oil. Um, if you get a new spring, you get 25mm extension space, so you get the preload spaces. Uh, you also get the preload caps that go on both forks. Obviously only one side is active because of the design of the fork, and that gives you up to 12mm of adjustable preload as well, on top of the three preload rings we supply with the forks. Okay, um, and can you without going into too much detail, can you give us a little bit of an overview of how the components work in that fork? So essentially we've extended the forks by 25 mil to match the rear 25 mil um, travel increase on the shock. We've changed the spring to a longer spring, which gives it a better stroke overall. And it's also a tapered spring. So this helps guide the spring and the fork uh, at a much better rate than the OEM one. So it just gives you a better action. We don't change any of the actual uh, damping cartridges. The forks actually have quite a good damping cartridge system in them, we found out attractive, so we've left that in there. Um, but we have changed some of the preload sort of capabilities uh, and again, some of the internal control capabilities of the fork. So again, it's giving the user the ability to fine tune the front suspension. Exactly that, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, what about the weight of the oil? So we use 10 weight um, on the BMW. The, obviously we changed the oil in the right hand leg and this weight is we found it just the right balance between sort of compression dampening and preload abilities for each rider um, so now we're about set on 10 weight for most average riders um, of an average weight and we're happy with the performance that that gives us okay um, so what order do things go back in and um, obviously in the film we saw your dad John working on it and you got involved to help a little bit um, so it is easier with two people. There's a step in this that makes it a little bit easier with two people. But yeah. could you talk us through step by step what we did to put the new stuff back in? Okay, so the right hand fork leg, um, we've all already loosened the top cap whilst it's in the bike. So we're going to put it on in the vice about 45 degrees. Um, so obviously no oil is going to come out when you take the top cap off. And then you can remove this using the 17 mil spanner in the vice. Um, at this point, you want to take the O-ring off the top cap and put that aside. That's very important because that goes on your preload cap that you put back in. Um, once you've got the top cap off, it's time to drain the fork completely of all the fluids. So turn it upside down, stroke the damper rod up and down and it will flush all the oil out. Um, again, take your time on this bit because you want to make sure that your oil measurements are correct and you haven't got any excess oil in the bottom of your fork. Uh, once you've drained the fork, it's turn the fork up um, the right way up and you want to do this on a flat, clean surface. Uh, you want to push the fork sanction all the way down so there's no tube showing and you want to make sure that your damper rod's pushed all the way down as well and that's when you add your 450 mil of 10 watt fork oil. So I've seen that um, you can get all sorts of syringes and devices to kind of set that air gap but I noticed when John was doing it he had quite a simple way of doing it and I, I think that's because most people he, he said most people have got a, a ruler yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so how is he doing that? Uh, the easiest way that we've found in sort of workshop conditions um, is by measuring the air gap and it's one of the only ways that you can actually allow for sort of machine intolerances in manufacturers forks as well. Um, so although it should be 450 mil of oil, uh, the air gap is of a higher priority than the capacity itself. So by measuring, I believe it's um, 120 millimetres from the top of the fork uh, and by doing with a decent steel rule you can measure making sure that all the fork is pressed down, your damper rod's pressed down, so the fork's in its lowest position, measure 120 mil from the top, and, and that's called your air gap, that distance from the top of the oil to the top of the fork. Yeah, so I guess when you empty the old oil out, there might be some residue in there, so that's gonna affect um, how much is already in there. Um, and I noticed with John, he was, he was um, pouring it in bit by bit and checking that gap, and uh, if he went over that, he poured a bit out, and so yeah. there's a little bit of kind of to and fro to get it yeah. right. It's quite an important sort of uh, parameter of the forks, the air gap, uh, especially if you've got air trapped in there, obviously from fr flushing the original oil out, you need to work the damp rod up and down. When you've measured it, I'd say just take a couple of minutes to make sure there's no excess air in the fork, because obviously that's taking up space and will affect your air gap in later life. Yeah. Great. Okay, so we've got the right amount of oil in, in the fork. 
uh, what happens next? It's time to put it back into the vise, 45 degrees again, stop the oil obviously tipping out the fork. And now you want to make sure that your fork is compressed all the way down, same with your damper rod. And it's time to put on the uh, retaining unit and after that the 25 mil preload unit onto the end of the thread. Okay, and that's just a piece of threads then? Yeah, and uh, this comes with two 16 mil spanners and you need We've provided those in the kit and that's used to lock those two together and it's quite an important part of the fork system itself so you need to make sure that's done nice and tight and uh, take plenty of time on that. Yeah, okay. Um, and then what happens after that? So the springs next, sliding the spring over those two units in the damper rod itself. Um, at this point you might need a hand from someone. You want to get two hands on the spring and pull it as far back as you can across those two units and then uh, as on the video you can see pushing that C-clip in it can be a uh, quite tight sometimes it's just worth having someone there to make sure nothing goes wrong and that spring's tapered so which way is the taper pointing so the taper is designed to point upwards and this helps us guide in the spring uh, sort of under fast fast action it keeps the spring nice and lined up and gives you a better action overall okay um and yeah so john was doing this and you got involved to help there i guess you could do it with one person but if you've got two two pairs of hands it makes life yeah easy. i mean it is possible i wouldn't recommend it with one um, so we've got that, what happens next? So now we've got that, we're going to slide our two spacers, two alley spacers um, over the damper rod unit and these will sit on the C-clip so when we remove that they'll slide down over the fork and seat properly into the fork. Okay so we're looking good, what happens next? Next um, is preload cap, so you're tightening that up against the original locking unit using the spanners provided and now there's another time when you want that other person there because you're going to have to pull that spring back um, to release that C-clip and that will let all the fork components slide into place together. Um, so again, there's a lot of tension there, so you want to be careful at this point. Okay, okay. And then? And then it's simply just putting the, uh, fork, putting the fork leg back up to the preload cap and screwing them together. Obviously, same again, you can't screw them as tight as you want to in the vise because you damage it. So you just get them about two turns off tight and tighten them in the bike. Okay, great. So it, it's it's all doable, um, and all the instructions come with the forks when you, when you get them. Um, but it's definitely a stage that you kind of want to just clear your mind, free yourself from distractions, and just go step by step and get it right. And that's it. Everything broken down into steps is very manageable and easy. It's just getting them in the right order that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, but doable, and I guess for the front forks, how long should you kind of... I would set? say total job, hour and a half to two hours. Yeah. Um, again, you, it's going to take you longer if you have to have them back out and start making changes to them and stuff like that. So you want to hit, hit it right the first time and try and learn as much as you can about how they work whilst you're doing it as well. I think as well, um, if, you, if you're not that confident um, doing this part of the project or you've never worked on forks before, two hours, turn your phone off, tell the kids not to come into the garage and just try and have no distractions, no reason to walk away from the stuff and come back and not remember where you're up to. So, yeah. Okay, so the, the fork internals are all done. Uh, the top caps are finger tight, and I guess it's just back in the bike at that point. Yes, it slide it into the uh, triple clamps. You want to tighten the lower triple clamps bolts first, leaving the top ones loose, obviously, because you have to tighten up the top cap of the fork. Um, we provided a billet spanner provided for that, so just get the pins in. You want a bit of hand pressure on the top so they don't slip out, and just tighten those up. Um, once you're happy that those are tight, you can then loosen off the lower tri um, triple clamp bolts a little bit and set your rotation of your fork leg and the height of your fork leg. You want sort of four mil sticking out, four to five mil sticking out the top of the top tri triple clamp. Okay, um, and then just tighten up the triple clamps? Yep, tighten them. Um, obviously, once it's all in there, um, I'd suggest going from lower to upper because then any force you're then pushing it out through the top of the, you don't want to trap that force in the middle of the fork. Um, and just torque ratings is obviously provided in the instructions, so just take care with those. Obviously, being up, upside down forks, the internals are more prone to damage than traditional style. Okay. Um, and just wheel on, I guess, after that. I mean, yeah, we put the, uh, the ABS sensor back on and the caliper back on the fork once that was in and then it's just, just a simple case of the mud guard and the wheel going in and the bike's all back up on the stand oem wheels back in and nicely balanced great and at, at that point if you haven't changed your wheels um you're good to go yeah. go enjoy it check everything over before you leave the leave the workshop and then go enjoy your bike yeah great
What are the rally raid wheels? Um, yeah, how are they different to what you get uh, as standard? So out of the shop, they come sp- uh, with cast wheels. They're fairly lightweight, but they're just not that strong realistically for adventure riding. Um, so we've developed our own set of heavy duty spoked wheels. We d- develop our own hubs and machine them in-house in the UK, um, laced in the UK. And we also offer tubeless on those as well. So that's quite a big addition for people that are doing the big distance miles or the sort of the cross country adventures, having a tubeless rim um, opens up a whole new range of A, tire choices and B, ways of repairing it if you do get a puncture, um, other than taking your wheel out and putting a new inner tube in it and piercing it. And, and obviously they look quite different. Uh, I, I guess having spoke wheels is very much more of the ad- adventure approach than the street approach. Definitely. I mean, um, the wheels that we make, we use heavy duty uh, stainless steel spokes. Uh, we use nickel plated nipples. So they really are the sort of high end wheels that you'd come to expect on an expensive adventure bike. I think they changed the look of the bike quite quite dramatically. Yeah. Definitely, they're really nice. Yeah. Um, and uh, are there any elements of the original wheels that you re- retain? I'm imagining um, you're going to want to keep your brake discs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, w- is there anything that anyone needs to know about how they swap those over? So uh, our wheels and hubs are designed to take your OEM discs. Um, the rear hub actually takes your OEM ABS ring as well. With the front, we've provided a ABS ring that's already mounted onto the hub and the wheel when you buy it so all you have to do is just put your disc on really simple just a couple of nylocks and the oem disc bolts um you're supplied with some washers as well in the video you see how these washers are meant to mount on the shoulder of the bolts and like i said changing disc over you just got to be careful obviously they're quite high torque bolts so you don't want to round any take your time and that's where good quality tools come in handier as opposed to sort of the cheaper softer metal tools and just make sure you use the, the right torque settings, I guess. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, and on the rear wheel, um, there's a cush drive, isn't there? So what do we do with that? The cush drive, um, it's literally take it out and just put it straight into our wheel. Everything, we've tried to design it to keep as OEM as possible. So the cush drive is just as simple as pulling it off, putting the three rubbers into our wheel and then pushing the push, cush drive in. Uh, and it's the same wheel spaces. We designed our wheels to use the OEM wheel spaces, so it's just a case of taking it out of your wheel and put it into ours. Okay, and we were almost finished at that point. I think the last thing we did was have a look at the rear luggage rack. Now, the bike does come with some grab handles that act as a luggage rack. So what is the point of the Rally Raid one? So what we've designed is a small plate. It's an additional plate onto the uh, OEM rear rack, and this allows you to mount sort of roto packs and some of the giant loop systems. We've laser cut and designed it so you can uh, have the exact mounting position for the for a wide range of sort of systems and accessories. So I guess the the rotor pack, um, which is for, you can get one for water, you can get one for fuel. That's that's a key part of that, I guess. Isn't yeah, it? I mean, we've t- tested those extensively on a lot of different bikes and that's sort of one of the main items or accessories we wanted to make sure definitely fitted. So the one gallon, the two gallon fuel or water both fit perfectly on the rear rack. Um, it's a really nice addition to the bike. You can get a lot of, a lot of decent stuff on there.
and that was it uh, and, and there are all sorts of other smaller aspects that i guess you could change um you can change mirrors and personalize the bike but really um i guess what rally raid is saying is that that you're taking the standard BMW G310 GS and you're um, just beefing it up and making it more adventure ready. Definitely. I mean, we've kind of completed the core package of what you'd put down for an adventure ready G310 GS now. Uh, obviously, like you said, there's more accessories that people could add themselves. But what we've built is more or less the core advanced package for any rider out there. And I've ridden a version of this bike uh, up in Northumberland trail riding on some pretty tricky trails as well. And I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, if you've never ridden a 310, it, it, it takes a little bit of getting used to. You've kind of got to um, really work at the higher revs to get the most out of it. But once you're there, um, it, it performs well. And Adam, you've ridden this bike in some pretty kind of tough terrain in Australia. How did you find it? I mean, fairly faultless in terms of its performance. You have to imagine this is a brand new bike, BMW have designed and released. There was very little testing out there at the time that we were sort of making the kit for the bike. So it was a bit of a baptism of fire. I went out to Australia and quite a few thousand miles out there. Obviously, the bikes are being ridden every weekend here in the UK. Amy Harberg's ridden from Mongolia back to Rally Raid on hers. And we've just had sort of outstanding response, not only from the performance of the bike itself in terms of the engine, but from the parts we've also designed for it. And I think um, something I've noticed going from or having ridden a standard bike to the um, the Rally Raid bike um, really uh, is the suspension. It, it takes some of that wallow kind of like softness out and you just need, definitely feel a bit more firmer and, and a bit more attack ready and uh, just makes it feel more like a grown up trail bike, I guess. Yeah, I think regardless of sort of engine size, power or anything like that, what's most important in bikes to us is sort of the rider input the performance in terms of control and handling of the bike um, comes before sort of speed for us. Yeah, great. So thank you for making it through to the end of this. Uh, I imagine if you've watched all of it, you are probably either considering or have the Rally Raid kit in front of you ready to, to go for it. Um, it's, it's, I'm not a mechanic. Uh, I'm a little bit mechanically minded. Um, it, it's totally doable for uh, the majority of people. I wouldn't be too intimidated. I guess the point that we keep getting across here is just take your time um, and try and create a bit of space that you're free from distractions. It's a really enjoyable process seeing your bike transform uh, and being able to have the components in your hands and you can really kind of get a feel for what you're taking out and what you're putting back in and the difference in quality there. This film's also available in bite-sized chunks in case you just want to know a little bit about various bits of the project or you want to do it bit by bit. And I guess the other thing worth mentioning Adam is if you actually really don't want to do this yourself uh, is there an option for Rally Raid to do this for a customer's bike? Yeah I mean we've done a lot of customer builds um, recently this year we've actually started having 310s available to buy off the showroom in a couple of BMW dealerships as well so if that's an option that you might be interested in get, get down to your local dealership. Yeah, great. Um, and where's where are we based? Where's Rally Raid based? If people do want to bring their bike here, so we're based in Northampton, um, and you can bring your bike directly to us. We've done a couple of deliveries as well for people, so just give us a call. I've really enjoyed the last couple of days doing this with you, Adam, um, and I really look forward to seeing more of these uh, baby GSs out on the trails. Um, and if you see someone riding one of these, do what you can to have a little go yourself. Though, uh, yeah, you might be surprised. Thank you for watching this to the very end. If you want to find out more about Rally Raid, you can find information on the website. There's also a website devoted to the uh, Rally Raid BMW G310 GS, a bit of a mouthful. Uh, and there's also lots of information on forums like ABV Rider. I'm Greg Villalobos. You can find out more about me online and on my YouTube channel. And you can see me riding this bike and also the other Rally Raid bike, the Honda CB500X. Thank you for your time. Good luck with your build. <laughs>